Vital Signs Report, um, which is a partnership between the Edmonton Social Planning Council and the Edmonton Community Foundation. Um, my name is Susan Morrissey. I'm the Executive Director with the Edmonton Social Planning Council, but I'm also co-chair for Vital Signs. Um, I just want to let people know that, believe it or not, this is actually our ninth year in a row of, of doing this report. Um, and we're, uh, we're very proud to be able to provide this to our community. Before we get started, um, I wish to acknowledge that we are located on Treaty, Treaty 6 territory and respect the histories, language, and culture of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continue to enrich our vibrant community. So Vital Signs is an annual checkup of the many community foundations uh, across Canada that prepare it. Um, Toronto does one, I know Calgary generally does one, um, and all across Canada. Um, community foundations are doing vital signs reports um, this year and they will have them available on uh, their websites if you're interested in finding out more about what's going on in some of the other uh, communities across Canada. It's a measure of how our community is doing based on several social indicators that reflect on quality of life. The goal of our report and today's presentation is to share this information in an easily digestible manner with as many people as possible, to acknowledge the social issues that are happening in our community and encourage learning, discussion and action by Edmontonians. In addition to appearing as an insert in the Edmonton Journal today, so some of you might have actually received it if you have print, if you receive print copies of the Edmonton Journal, the report is also available on both of our agencies' website as well as the Edmonton Journal online version. At this time, I want to acknowledge and thank the individuals on our advisory committee for their contribution to the report. These are the content experts, as we call them, um, that we met with repeatedly over the year to ensure we had access to good solid research data, that we understood and accurately framed the issues, and that they were an actual voice for our community. So I'm going to just very briefly just read out the names of all of the advisory committee members to you, <clears throat> excuse me, and the agencies that they represent. Uh, Eric Abbottman from the End Poverty Edmonton. Um, Hardinger Clark from, she's a senior policy analyst with Alberta Community and Social Services. Colleen Dirksen, and she is a social worker uh, manager with SAGE Seniors Association. Wendy McDonald, who is the Chief Operating Officer for Inclusion Alberta. Allison McIntosh, who is a community member. Amber Niemeyer, who is the Director of External Relations, a YMCA. Doug Paquette, who is the Executive Director of the Edmonton Regional Immigrant Employment Council. Taylor Soroka, who is the co-founder of Jasper Place Wellness Center. And Shan Svensson, who is Neighborhood Services City of Edmonton. In addition um, to the advisory committee, our steering committee consists of Elizabeth Bonkink, who is the communications and team lead for the Edmonton Community Foundation. Um, Amy Jo, which was our summer student who actually helped us with this project at the Social Planning Council. Sydney Shelloff, who is the research officer at the Edmonton Social Planning Council. Neka Atabulu, who is the Director of Communications and Equity Strategies, Edmonton Communities Foundation. And we had Rowan L. Bailey, who was with the Edmonton Social Planning Council and also worked on this project, and myself. So at this point in time, I'm going to turn it over to both Elizabeth and to Sydney, who are going to present some of the data for you. 
Thanks, Susan. I'm going to go first and we're just going to go back and forth if uh, so that we can break it up a little bit and you don't get sick of hearing just one of our voices. So there is a fair bit of data here um, and we hope that you do take some time to to look through it and um, and we'll be happily happily will take questions at the end if you'd like. Um, so the first place we want to start is a primer on income. In this topic, we learned about some of the terms you hear when you talk about poverty and low income. We also took a look at one of the largest cohorts in Edmonton that is living in poverty, and that is single adults. They are three times as likely to live in poverty than any other family type. And 70% of those living in deep poverty are single. So we start with the definition of minimum wage, and that's the lowest wage that an employer can legally pay an employee. Uh, for adults, that's $15, and for those under the 18 years of age, it's $13 per hour. The living wage in Edmonton is $16.51, and living wage is defined as the amount that people need to make working full-time to provide for themselves and their families to reach a basic financial security, live with dignity, and participate in the community. And in this section, we also provide a sample budget for a single person working full-time. This is extremely modest. It doesn't account for um, acquisition of furniture or other housewares, gifts, vacation, tra or transportation beyond a bus pass. Um, imagine if you're a single person working minimum wage full time and you have an emergency. Are you going to hop on the bus or are you going to call an Uber? So that that's what the kind of things that we look at. We looked at here with um, having such a modest budget that doesn't leave very much for emergencies or for any extra expenditures. And in fact, the grocery allowance is based on the nutritious food basket. This would be a basic grocery list and doesn't include anything extra. No treats, no splurges, no eating out at all. And at the end of the week, only $35 is left for things like prescriptions, clothing, footwear, or entertainment. Um, and the next topic on the on this and basic income is unconditional payment. Uh, sorry, it, the next topic we introduce is the base, is basic income, which is an un unconditional payment of the from the government to individuals or families, and it's to cover essential costs of living. It is then based taxed on uh, the total income, and income earned is not clawed back and should not be a liability for recipients of basic income. And we have some examples of this already happening in Canada, and one is old age security. Another is guaranteed income supplement, and the third is the GST credit. And if universal basic income, meaning available to all, is instituted properly, it should reduce poverty, encourage employment, uh, reduce the stigma associated with physical or mental health-related disabilities, and produce better health outcomes and improve quality overall. Um, we give a definition of poverty, which is the condition that a person who is deprived of resources, means, choices, and power necessary to acquire and maintain a basic level of standards of basic level of living standards and participation in society. Remember, poverty is not only about money; it's also it excludes people, and it's often very disrespectful. Poverty is also time-consuming. Many of our systems take up uh, that we have set up to assist those living in poverty require constant proof of poverty while trying to find food, housing, or transportation. And one of the ways that Canada measures poverty is with the market basket measure. This is a set of goods and services that represent a modest standard of living. A family is considered low income if they cannot afford the, the market basket measure. And using this measure, 10% of Edmontonians are currently living in poverty. Um, so we move on to uh, low income measure. A household is considered low income if it falls below 50% of median household incomes. And Canada's pre-tax income was 36,760 for an individual and 87,930 for a family. And remember a person working full-time at minimum wage in Edmonton, they make a little over 29,000 in pre-tax. So by this definition, they are definitely low income. A low income cutoff is, thresh, is the threshold below which a family will devote a larger share of its income on necessities and, than the average family. And the family is considered low income if it spends 20% or more on these necessities. Alberta has one of the highest income inequalities in Canada. The bottom 20% of income earners spend an average of $45,000 on household expenses, while the top 20% spend almost three times as much. And in 35 years, the top 1% of tax filers saw a 56.8% increase in income, but the bottom 50% only saw a 3.2% increase. 
And the last place we look at in term on the in the primer is the labor force. Labor force participation is defined as those 15 years or older who are working or actively seeking employment. And in 2019, 72% of our population was participating in the labor force. Pre-pandemic Edmonton, unemployment rate for men was 8.8 .8 and 6% for women. 8.8 .8 for men, 6% for women. And in 2020, Canada's overall unemployment rate, rate was 11.4%. In Alberta, Alberta males aged 15 to 24 had the highest unemployment rate at 24.3, but women aged 25 to 45 had the lowest at 8.8 .8 during the pandemic. You gotta remember that this is slightly misleading though, because the unemployment rate only counts those who are actively looking for, point, for employment. And 20,600 women left the workforce in just the first seven months of the pandemic. Women are more likely to work in industries that are, that are, adapt, that are not adaptable for, to working from home. And women with children under the age of six accounted for 66% of that exit. And last, we take a look at the sectors where Edmontonians are working. The highest sector of employment is sales and service, while the lowest sectors of employment are arts and culture and sport tied with natural resources and agriculture. I'll turn it over to Sydney. Thank you. So I'm gonna start talking about uh, the gaps in the social safety net. So our social safety net was created to help vulnerable populations. But over time, this net has become very complicated, difficult to navigate, and often insufficient to meet people's needs. Steep clawback rates and penalties mean that when people try to improve their situation, they could end up actually reducing their income. Now, before the pandemic, a lot of Canadians were struggling financially. 31% so of Canadians didn't earn enough to cover the bills, and Canadians owned about $1.76 in debt for every dollar of disposable income. Now, these issues have become exposed by the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, in March 2020, 2.1 million people worked fewer than half their, old, their normal hours. Uh, next slide. Uh, so now I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into Alberta Works. So Alberta Works is a last resort income program that was created to protect families from the impact of economic disasters. But Alberta Works benefits are well below the low income measure in Canada. They only cover 37% of the basic monthly living costs for a single Albertan. And these income supports can drive people further into poverty. So in order to qualify, a person has to get rid of their most, most of their assets and savings, steep clawback rates, discourage people from finding work and improving their situation. Uh, for example, a single person would have their benefits reduced by 75 cents for every dollar they make over $230 of monthly income. So working to increase their income would actually result in their benefits being reduced to zero before they earn enough to reach the poverty line. And now CERB is complicating things even further. Uh, so CERB and CRB, as I'm sure you all know, were intended to help out people who lost their jobs due to COVID-related shutdowns. But these programs had a lot of eligibility requirements that left people out. So pe they don't cover reduced hours or people who don't have work but were not laid off. Now, 10,000 fewer Alberta households received Alberta Works due to serve eligibility, 92% of whom were single adults and single parents. But unfortunately, accessing CERB and CRB may harm these traditional income support recipients. Since it's being treated as earned income, their Alberta Works benefits will be reduced dollar for dollar, and it could reduce rent subsidies. So next slide, please. And now employment insurance is a temporary income support program designed to help newly unemployed workers as they look for a new worker upgrade their skills. It provides 55% of a person's average insurable weekly earnings. However, before the pandemic, only 30% of the unemployed in Canada's three largest labor markets were getting EI benefits. And this is largely because eligibility rules leave out a lot of people. People in short-term contracts, temporary agency employment, or seasonal work are not eligible. And since the service sector is characterized by unstable, insecure, and part-time schedules, many of these workers are left out as well. Now, COVID did lead to some EI enhancements. Uh, the hours needed to qualify have been reduced, so it's a little easier to access now. Um, another income support is Alberta's child care subsidy, which helps offset child care costs. 
These subsidies are based off of the age of the child, the family's income, and type of care. Um, listed in this table on the slide are the maximum amounts families can get, but as you can see, they're still quite a bit below the cost of childcare. You know, child care is getting increasingly more expensive and the subsidy isn't really keeping up. Also, another issue is that the subsidy does not line up with the typical pricing structure of daycare. Uh, when a child ages from 18 to 19 months, their benefit is reduced by $100, yet their child care costs remain the same. So parents end up having to spend more. Now, lastly, charities play a big role in the social safety net by providing important services not provided by governments. But unfortunately, charities rely on donations, volunteer labor, and government funding. And there's no guarantee that charities will have the resources to provide their services regularly or equitably. And COVID has, again, made this harder on charities. 40% of Canadians say their donations have decreased since the pandemic. Yet at the same time, demand for services has increased. So charities are having to do more with less. Um, and next slide. Uh, so now uh, we'll, we're going to take a look at AISH, Assured Income for the Severely Handicapped. So AISH is really strict. Uh, to qualify, a person's disability must severely and permanently impair them from fi finding employment. Though there are a lot of people out there with disabilities who can't access AISH. So people on AISH receive uh, $20,222, but this amount is well below Canada's low income threshold. And people on AISH are encouraged to work and bring in additional income. Uh, but like Alberta Works, steep clawback rates actually discourage this. Um, if a person makes above $1,072 per month, their benefit is reduced by 50 cents for every dollar they make above that threshold. And if they make over $2,009, their benefit is reduced dollar for dollar. So a person can really only work 17 hours a week at minimum wage without it affecting their benefit. So on the right is a, the budget of someone living on H income. And I just wanted to highlight a couple items on this um, budget. So a person on H's monthly income is $1,685. Now, if they can get into subsidized housing, they would pay about $568 a month. Now, this is still uh, roughly 34% of their income. And in order for housing to be affordable, it should only be 30%. And another thing to note is that subsidized housing is really hard to get into. I bet there are lots of people on age who are likely spending much more than this. Um, groceries we got from the... Uh, nutritious food basket for Edmonton and is budgeted at $284.88 a month. And again, this is quite a conservative estimate. You know, there are lots of people with disabilities who have specialized diets who are likely spending more than this. So this budget would leave a person only $153.37 for everything else they needed. And again, these costs are the bare minimum. So people are likely spending more than this. So as you can see, age income really doesn't go very far, and a lot of recipients still struggle to meet their basic needs. Uh, now I'll turn it back to Elizabeth. <laughs> Got to remember to unmute. <laughs> Um, so the next area we looked at was small business. We wanted to find out who is um, who's providing employment in Edmonton. So if we're going to truly look at making ends meet, we need to look at where the money is coming from and how people are earning. So um, we took a look at small business and found that 94.4% of all businesses in Edmonton is considered a small business. And that ha that is defined as between one and 49 employees. The top four types of businesses are professional, scientific, and technical, healthcare and social assistance, construction, and retail trade. And small businesses is important to Alberta as well. It accounts for 36% of the private sector employment and generates 28% of Alberta's gross domestic product. In 2020, more than 350,000 individuals were self-employed in Alberta. Only about 33% are women, and slightly less than that amount were 55 years of age or older. 15.1% were Indigenous, and 20.9% are landed immigrants. The main reasons for wanting to be self-employed? Wanting to be your own boss. <laughs> but women were also most likely to cite uh, work-life balance and were wanting to work few and wanting to work fewer hours, and in fact did work fewer hours than women who were employed. 
Average base earning for a small business owner in Edmonton was $42,000, uh, where the overall average earnings in Alberta is $61,766. So um, your desire to own a small business is not going to solely be based on how much money you're going to make. <laughs> um, it may, it is in fact, um, other factors that, that go into that. Um, so next slide. Uh, so we looked at who is starting uh, a business in Canada, and recent immigrants are more likely than Canadian-born individuals. Um, and it was only, and fewer than 1% were an individual with disability. But not surprising, those starting a business were more likely to have a partner, either married or living together, and were more likely unemployed. Women are underrepresented as business owners in Canada. Only 15.6% of small and medium enterprises were female-owned in 2017 and 20.9 more were equally male and female owned. Income of female business owners are, imagine that, only 70% of what male business owners make. Uh, but immigrant owned businesses are fast growing and create jobs. And the Bu Business Development Bank of Canada says that newcomers have an entrepreneurial rate that is more than double of those born in Canada. However, only 1.4% of small and medium enterprises are indigenous owned. But of those, uh, the majority of those are sole proprietors. Next slide. We took a look at other ways um, Edmontonians make ends meet, uh, one of which is gig work, uh, which refers to part-time or contract work. And we wanted to see who was gigging. So one in three had a university degree and 13.7% of men and 16.5% of women held a master's degree or higher and more immigrant men than Canadian born men are gigging. We looked at multiple job holders. More self-employed people held multiple jobs than those who were employed. 60% of multiple job holders who were self-employed were also self-employed in their second job. And a great deal of money is being made in the underground economy. In 2018, $6.2 billion changed hands. This is most common in residential construction, retail trade, finance, insurance, real estate, rental, and holding companies, and accommodation and food services. And with multi-level marketing, although many of the people involved in multi-level marketing think of themselves as small business owners, studies show that only a few actually make money. The last, uh, area, the last couple areas that we look at is social enterprise. It's not a defined term within Canada's Income Tax Act, but they are known to be a special kind of business where the organization has a social impact. Employment social enterprises are businesses that are created, that create training and employment opportunities. In 2016, that provided employment for 31,000 workers in Canada, including many individuals with disabilities. And those who worked for these special social enterprises reported that they had the ability to, make, to meet their basic needs, were less likely to use the foot bank, food bank, and some reported uh, their health improved and the majority say they have a greater quality of life. And a quick look at the pandemic and what was happening with business then. During the pandemic, whether in a, employed in a small or large firm, women saw more job loss overall. And in terms of businesses opened and closed, um, we had pretty much the same number of business open, businesses opened in February of 2020 as in February of 2021. Um, and the same number, uh, pretty close to the same number closed as well. So, um, it's interesting that the that in February 2020, 1825 opened and 1878 closed, and there the numbers are super close. So um, while we thought we believe that it's uh, taking a big toll on our small businesses, as many as opening are are opening as closing. And I'll turn it over to Sydney. Great, thank you. Um Okay, so we talk a lot about how Edmontonians make ends meet, but it's important to acknowledge that certain groups in our communities face unique barriers in making ends meet. So intersectionality refers to the cumulative ways in which the effects of multiple forms of discrimination overlap or intersect, especially in the experiences of marginalized individuals or groups. So first we're gonna take a look at women. Women face gender discrimination and may also experience intersectional barriers related to race, gender identity, ability, or age that hinder their earning potential. You know, women of all intersectionalities are overrepresented in low wage precarious work. You know, more than 1.5 million women in Canada live in poverty. 
and women with multiple marginalized identities are especially vulnerable. For example, 30% of single mothers are raising their children in poverty, and 34% of First Nations women and girls live in poverty. Now, the income gap exists. Women in Edmonton earned about 71 cents for every dollar men made. Uh, there are a handful of reasons for this. Uh, women are more likely to hold a college degree than men, yet male-dominated industries tend to be higher paying, and women-dominated industries are often undervalued. Uh, women are also more likely to engage in unpaid domestic labor, which may take them away from work. And they are also more likely to work part time. And next slide, please. Uh, women are also more vulnerable to violence and experiences of violence can affect someone's ability to make ends meet. About 80% of people who experience domestic violence Violence report that their work performance is negatively affected. You know, this may be because the violence continues at the workplace when their abuser calls them or shows up. Someone may call in sick after experiencing violence. And in addition, 10% of women experience gender discrimination in the workplace. Uh, the Alberta Human Rights Commission reports that the top areas of complaint are physical disability, mental disability, gender, race, color, and ancestry origin. Now, 77% of discrimination complaints were about employment practices, and experiencing discrimination in employment can negatively affect one's ability to make ends meet. Uh, so LGBTQ2S plus persons also face inequalities. So LGBTQ2S plus persons are often highly educated. 24% of their population is currently enrolled in post-secondary education, compared to only 13% of the non-LGBTQ2S plus population. However, it's important to note that this stat can partially be explained by the fact that the LGBTQ2S plus population is younger than the general population. Uh, now, despite these higher levels of education, 33% of them found it, it difficult to meet their basic needs. And they are also much more likely to experience sexual harassment in the workforce. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so now we're going to take a look at persons with disabilities. So 6.2 million Canadians live with a disability. And the employment rate for persons with disabilities is a whole 20.7 percentage points lower than able-bodied persons. They are more likely to work part-time and bring home a much lower median after-tax income. Again, using this intersectional lens, we can see that persons with disabilities who are also visible minorities face unique discriminations. Visible minorities with disabilities are twice as likely to hold a bachelor's degree or higher than non-visible minorities with disabilities. However, one third of them say, that their work does not give them the opportunity to use all their education, skills, or experience. And lastly, uh, women with disabilities are also more vulnerable to sexual harassment. 35% uh, of women with a disability experience sexualized behaviors in the workplace compared to only 20% of women without a disability. Uh, next slide. Uh, so now visible minorities. Uh, Edmonton has a large visible minority population. In 2016, visible minorities made up just over a quarter of the total working age population. And visible minority Albertans have higher rates of education than non-minorities, yet they have higher unemployment rates. Um, in 2016, Black Edmontonians had the highest unemployment rate at 13.9% compared to 8.1% for non-visible minorities. Uh, visible minorities also experience greater underemployment. They often work in lower paying occupations and are less represented in management. Uh, there have been studies that show that candidates with foreign Saudi names are less likely to get a callback for job interviews. And then immigrants also face unique discriminations. 60% uh, of underemployed Canadians are immigrants. Uh, this is often because the credentials they received in their country of origin are not fully represent 
not fully recognized here. And now senior women, uh, senior women make up two thirds of all seniors living in poverty. And senior women who belong to other marginalized groups are even more vulnerable. 24% of senior indigenous women and 22.6% of senior immigrant women lived in low income in 2015. And racialized seniors have much lower retirement incomes than white seniors. Um, and lastly, we're going to take a look at Indigenous persons. So 5.49% of Edmonton's population are Indigenous. Um, indigenous women are more likely to hold a bachelor's degree or above than Indigenous men. And Indigenous people living off reserve make up 4.5% of Alberta's overall employment. However, their unemployment rate is much higher than non-Indigenous Albertans, 13.2% compared to 7.3%. Okay, thanks. I will pass it back to Elizabeth now. So we're going to switch over to living in Edmonton. We've covered our four areas of topic for this year on uh, making ends meet. And we always have the last section of Vital Signs talk about what it's like live, living in Edmonton at this time. So it's sort of a snapshot of what's happening. Um, so this, this section focuses on Edmonton census metropolitan area, unless otherwise stated, and then we would say city of Edmonton. In our most recent Leger survey, we had commissioned for 2021, only 46% of Edmontonians rated their life as good or excellent. This is down from 59% in 2020. So it can't all be pandemic if in 2020, people still have felt that they had a, a reasonably good life. We also took a look at where City of Edmonton tax dollars go. The two largest pieces of the pie go to community services and attractions and Edmonton Police Service. 15 minute districts are in the plans to help Edmontonians meet their basic needs and within 15 minutes of where they live. Edmonton Public Library, as always, is serving our community well. More than 280,000 people use their library card in 2020 and 15,000 individuals signed up for a new card. Our emergency room saw fewer visits in 2019, but, but the 211 service had an increase in calls. And only 45% of Edmontonians felt that there were ab adequate job opportunities in 2021. This is down from 2018 and significantly lower than 2014 when 76% felt that there were adequate job opportunities. Next slide. And not surprising, our, the unemployment rate in Edmonton was the highest it's been since 1993 in 2020. Youth unemployment was at 27.7%. More than 61,000 Edmontonians earned minimum wage between July 2019 and June 2020, and 81.2% .2 of those earning minimum wage are 20 years of age or older. In Alberta, 245,000 individuals make minimum wage, and 61.5% of those are female. Only 15.7% of Edmontonians make the living wage of $16.51 per hour. In 2019, almost 13% of Edmontonians lived in poverty and 34.7% of single parents and second largest group of single adults at 25.7%. Alberta still has the large, largest income disparity problem. The median income for the top 1% is 350,000 where the median income for the bottom 1% is only 42,000. It makes sense that 66% of Edmontonians believe that poverty is still a significant problem. And a quick look at volunteering and giving. 43% of Edmontonians volunteered less than they did pre-pandemic and 46% said they gave the same amount to charity. Of those volunteering, the areas most often volunteered, local community, local community seniors, children, and youth. And I'll pass it back over to Sydney. So I'm gonna take a look at housing. So the vacancy rate in Edmonton was 7.2 in 2020. Now this is a quite a big jump from a rate of 4.9 in 2019. Now the average rent uh, is $1,153. Now this is an average of all different bedroom types though. So also in 2020, the average residential selling price was about 364,000. So Edmonton was found to be the most affordable of major housing markets in Canada. 
Uh, but despite this alleged affordability, there is a very large homeless population in Edmonton. 2,601 people experienced homelessness in July of 2021, which is almost 1,000 more people than this time last year. Um, and Indigenous people are overrepresented in homelessness. Uh, if you remember earlier, I said that Indigenous people make up about 5.5% of Edmonton's population, but they represented 59% of the homeless population. Uh, now, according to a Leger survey, 52% uh, of Edmontonians believed that food security is a significant problem. No, and it is. About one in 10 households in Canada experience food insecurity. You know, some groups are more vulnerable to food insecurity than others, such as female lone parents, single people, and recent immigrants. But there are some great nonprofits in Edmonton who help people experience some food insecurity. You know, in 2020, um, Edmonton's food bank served an average of 21,000 people a month and 60,896 different people received at least one hamper throughout 2020. The Leftovers Foundation is an organization that rescues food that would otherwise go to waste from restaurants, bakeries, and grocery stores. So this was great uh, when businesses suddenly had to close during COVID shutdowns and leftovers could redistribute some of the food that restaurants wouldn't be able to sell. So they redistributed to organizations that serve people in need. Um, in 2020, they diverted 154,566 1, pounds of food, providing 81,413 meals. Um, and community gardens are also a great way to combat food insecurity. There are more than 80 of these in Edmonton. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, no transportation. Uh, cars are the main source of transportation for the vast majority of Edmontonians. You know, according to a Leger survey, 80% of Edmontonians use a car as their main source. Uh, but 14% of Edmontonians use public transit as their main source of transportation. And in 2019, there was an average of 227,600 and 200, yeah, 200, 27,608 alightings and boardings on the LRT every weekday. Um, however, Edmonton's perceptions on the ease of public transportation have been going down. Um, in 2020, 39% of Edmontonians said that public transport was easy to use. And now in 2021, only 24% say it is. Um, and lastly, Edmonton is now the largest city in Canada. Canada to have on-demand transit. So 57 accessible shuttles are available for ETS riders to book trips on, uh, but this has replaced 100 traditional transit routes. And back to Elizabeth. Thanks, we're almost done. Hang in there. <laughs> um, so on the final page of Vital Signs, we talk, start to talk a little bit about some of the harder issues plaguing Edmonton. In 2018, 4.5% of Edmonton residents were victims of sexual or physical assault. And this is likely low as this is self-reported data and we know that a fair bit of sexual assault goes unreported. One in four Edmontonians experienced unwanted sexual behavior in public. Females, female victims were far more often than males and one in eight said they, the, most serious, the most serious incidences took place on public transit. In 2019, there were more than 82,000 property crime violations and almost 18,000 violent criminal code violations. The crime severity index dropped in 2020 to 104.78 incidences per 100,000 of the population from 115.76. Domestic violence, however, was up 13.5% over 2019. The pandemic has made difficult situations much harder. Drug and alcohol use is also on the rise in Edmonton. 404 Edmontonians died of an opioid poisoning in 2020, and even those safe consumption sites were visited more than 2,000 times. Um, and according to wastewater survey, survey among major cities, Edmonton has the second highest levels of fentanyl after v Vancouver, and the highest levels of methamphetamine loads were found in Edmonton. And Edmonton had also the second highest levels of the compound that is found in cannabis. 
A quarter of those who previously consumed alcohol or cannabis before the pandemic said that their consumption increased during the pandemic. And the two main reasons they cited for this was boredom and stress. And in, our in the last section of, the, of living in Edmonton, Edmonton is yet again close to being one of the worst places in the world to be a, can to be a woman. Oh, sorry, next slide. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, Edmonton is one, again, one of the worst places in, in Canada to be a woman. The main factors contributing to this ranking are rates of intimate partner violence, which we just heard has gone up during the pandemic. Economic participation and security, women are still only making a fat fraction of what men make. And during the pandemic, more women than men left the workforce, so largely to care for children. So this is likely not to have changed. And finally, the leadership and political empowerment. Hopefully with the upcoming municipal election, we can see an improvement in the number of female councillors. We did not gain any footholding in the federal election because there's still only one out of eight ridings in Edmonton held by a woman. And we want to take a look at the, num the other members of our families, other members of our household that rounded our families. We have 77,000 licensed pets in, in Edmonton, but the actual number is li likely significantly higher because this only counts licensed pets. And in fact, this is down about 20,000 in count from 2020. 58% uh, 58 per 58 of the households in Canada own at least one cat or dog and cats outnumber dogs. The favorite breed of cat where the breed is listed is Siamese, Ragdoll, or Maine Coon, and for dogs, Labrador Retriever, Shih Tzu, or German Shepherd in Edmonton. And top names in Edmonton for your pets, Luna, Bella, Sadie, Stella, and Ellie for female dogs, and for male dogs, Charlie, Jasper, Winston, Bear, and Jax. And that brings us to the end. So if we have questions, we can certainly take them. Let's see, we've got a couple in the chat box here. Oh, heck yeah, you can have the presentation. <laughs> so, um, Elizabeth, before uh, I actually have to depart, but before I depart, I just need to make two um, slight corrections. You know, it wouldn't be a vital signs uh, presentation if I didn't mess up a name or do something like that. So, first of all, to Amber uh, Nehemiah, she actually is with the YWCA as opposed to the YMCA, although she says she frequently gets told that they're, she works for the YMCA. And again, I just wanted to take this opportunity to acknowledge uh, Lori Segretson, who is on this video uh, call today, and she is the MLA with the Edmonton Riverview. So thanks very much, Lori, for joining us and for everyone else. I'm going to turn it back over to you folks um, if you have any questions for Elizabeth and for Sydney on this. And thanks for joining us today. I do see one that somebody is asking for slides. We will actually have the recording available for you. Um, if you want the slides, pop me an email. I'll, I'll send them over to you. It's basically what's in the report. So we just captured what was that and put it, what was in the report and put it in a PowerPoint. So. Uh, any other questions? If you would like additional copies of your vital signs report, we are happy to send them over to you. We have 10,000 copies at the Edmonton Community Foundation office. We can, there's about 250 in a box. I'm happy to send a box, or if you just want a couple, we'll send those over for you. Just give a call to our office, which is 780-426-0015. Uh, or you can just Google us and get the number um, and our receptionist will send them over. Um, uh, there's a question from Deborah Meeple. Um, in the stats about poverty, are there any figures for reduced income due to caregiving? Uh, well, we do know that women have left the workforce, um, to, particularly during the pandemic, to look after uh, young children. I think um, we lost, I think, I believe, sixty-six thousand jobs, uh, female jobs in Alberta. Um, that these are people who have left the workforce, so they are not actively looking for work. They're staying at home to to do to caregiving. Um, we do know that one of the greatest ways you can indicate you can, we can get work towards getting off that list of the worst place in Canada to be a woman is for us to have um, daycare that's accessible, affordable, and will allow women to participate in the workforce. Do you have anything you want to add, Sydney? 
Um, nope, that's about it, I would say. Any, um, I think there was a follow up to that same question. Um, if there's any information of children providing caregiving for a disabled or ill parent. I believe that there is um, H, not Asia, sorry, there is CERB available for those who were caring during um, the pandemic or still, uh, and uh, if you had to leave work to care for a child or a family member, but I don't know that that carries through to unemployment necessarily. Do you have better stats on that, Sydney? I don't know oh. unemployment that well. Um, I think, I don't think we grabbed anything specifically for this report, because I know there's, um, the concept of like the sandwich generation of people who are having to provide for both care for both their children and their parents at the same time. Um, I don't think we have stats specifically in this report, but if you're interested, uh, you can shoot me an email and I can see what I can dig up for you. Okay. Uh Melanie Lukovich asked, uh, while compiling this information, did you surprise, did anything surprise you or provide some hope to your staff? I think there's a lot that surprised me. I don't know if it necessarily provided hope. <laughs> uh, I think the number one thing that surprised me was um, the rate of poverty among single adults. We always think of single adults as footloose and fancy free and, you know, got the world by the horns kind of thing, but really they are the ones who are struggling the most. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that's what kind of struck me. Anybody on the committee want to chime in on this? I think it was interesting when we spoke about intersectionality to see how poverty really is highlighted in intersectionality and how when you dive deep, you can see how someone who might be struggling financially, how those burdens can build up and then put them in even a harder place to begin with. So I think that was a big takeaway from our committee and hearing everyone's perspective on that and then the actual data to back that up, not just our work and what we're seeing in front of us. So that was very interesting. Anybody else wanna chime in? Go ahead, Doug. Comment too. And it's, it, it's something that if you, you know, sort of familiar with some of these poverty issues is it always blows me away how much time poverty takes in people's lives. And it just, it's not something that we think about uh, when we consider poverty as a, you know, as an issue, I mean, it, 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 you make assumptions or maybe even some wrong stereotypes, but the, yeah, the, the amount of time that poverty takes for individuals is, is really mind blowing, really. And I think it's really exasperated by the, uh, the, the transit changes. I mean, on-demand transit doesn't work for everyone. If you don't have a cell phone <laughs> and you, if you have an appointment to at a, a social agency, it, you have to plan hours in advance. Taylor, you probably have some direct stories, don't you? Yeah, many clients. And that's the frustrating thing is not only do you have to be able to um, afford the bus ride in whatever capacity that takes, you also have to have cell phone minutes or access to some type of communication to get the bus to you, which um, is backwards and doesn't actually represent the need that we see in our communities um, or the individuals we're serving. It's actually making... Well, to speak with what Doug said, the time and the capacity, it makes everything so much harder. So perhaps not only are you waiting in line for something, you're also having to do all of those intricate steps just to get to wait in line and hopefully receive services in the time frame that the organization is open or um, your actual appointment time. So again, intersectionality and all very cumulative um, to create more barriers for community members that we can see through this information today are already struggling so deeply. Great. Um, it, it, there was a question about what is the 26th city? I don't remember, it was a smaller city than ours, but um, all of the sources for the data are available at both the Edmonton Social Planning Council website, as well as the Edmonton Community Foundation website. You can, you can go and find more 
details on any particular topic just by going through the source document. Um, yeah, comment here, many bus rides take over three hours each direction. Mm -hmm. um, the ne oh yeah, so uh, thank you for the great information question comes to mind, now what? Does anyone think it'll generate a collaboration conversation to as follow up to the reports? Well, one of the things that Edmonton Community Foundation does is we fund charities. So <laughs> if you have um, ideas or you have thoughts on ways that you can help um, and you're with a, um, a charitable organization, please submit some submit our submit a request for funding from us. By all means, use the data in vital signs to back up your reasonings why you think you need funding. Um, we often have vital signs specific granting programs, but you don't have to use those. You can go through our general grants program, our small grants program. If you have youth that are active in your organization, you can go through our Young Edmonton Grants Program. So um, we're here to fund your solutions. Unfortunately, we don't have all the answers, but uh, hopefully with the data being out there, people will start to talk about it. Um, one of the things that I always say about vital signs is that it's bus literature. So people will read it today and go, hmm, didn't know that, and maybe leave it on the bus and somebody else will pick it up and go, hmm, didn't know that. Um, and we're never going to move anybody's mind a full spectrum, but we might nudge it a bit more towards where we need to go. Um, Just one other comment. And I yeah. mean, there is uh, a major event coming up here in the city, a democratic one. And, um, and right. so I think uh, this, kind, this information may be very useful when looking at candidates and your wards and, and your mayoral um, you know, so selection. So use this information and, and check the platforms of your candidates. And I think that, you know, I don't like the idea that we feel helpless or hostage to some of these issues. I, I think that there are things we can do and, and the, t the time